Hi, everyone. First reading today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and can be found on the front of your pink insert. <clears throat> As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins, in which you, you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgr transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us, up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Second reading is on the back of the pink handouts from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 21. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not unlawful for them to do, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about it. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through victory, through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Well, if you've got your sermon outline there, which is pretty nice and bare for you, plenty of room to put your notes on uh, and the pig hand out. Uh, very good. As we go back into Matthew this morning, we've just come through Chrissy, and of course, I mean it's hard, hard to miss with all the decorations around still. But with with Christmas, of course, comes what Christmas tradition, yeah. What kind of Christmas traditions have you been focusing on, and has been a part of your uh, family or your life? Maybe even not just for days or weeks or months, perhaps even years, you've cultivated certain traditions. Uh, of course, for me, it's breaking more than one window through backyard cricket. That seems to be a regular occurrence. Uh, eating far too many prawns, um, because they're so good, right? Um, but more than that, 
of course, there's presence. Of course, for so many people, the priority is family. Uh, for so many people, even that, it's just being able to have time off from work. We're so used to the rhythms of that traditions afford us. But let's just take a moment and step back and think about those traditions. Because what if those traditions that we have built up over weeks, months, years, what if they actually overshadow the meaning of whatever we're celebrating? Think about Christmas for a second. Is Christmas about these traditions or is Christmas actually about the birth of our Saviour? You see? I wonder if we've put so much time, or for many of us here or certainly around the world, we put so much time and effort to those traditions that they overshadow what we're meant to be celebrating, the very point of the season. Well, actually, maybe the traditions we've created for ourselves have become rules. And we hold so tightly to those rules. Maybe you hold so hold tightly, so hold tightly to something like we have to have the family at Christmas Day. It can't be Boxing Day. It can't be the day after Boxing Day. It's got to be Christmas Day. But then have we overshadowed the whole meaning and purpose that Jesus Christ came to die to save sinners? See what traditions and how it can do. How they overshadow and become rules. In fact, today, what we're going to be seeing in just a little bit is what Jesus values. What Jesus so clearly values in the story today, and it's a story of confrontation to be sure, but what we're going to see today for us to note is that Jesus is the Lord of mercy. He's the Lord of mercy. We're going to go through this together. As we come to Matthew chapter 12, uh, there's a lot been going on in the last couple of chapters. Basically, the theme is confrontation. Because Jesus, the king and his kingdom, he's come to bring and usher in a new kingdom, his kingdom. Obviously, that's going to, he's been encountering and will continue to encounter various opposition. And surprisingly, maybe for many of us here, the opposition comes very, very close to home. It's not kind of out there in the dregs in the world. It's actually among his own people, among family and even friends. But the opposition is very close. And so what we're seeing here today is that continued opposition. And we don't just have a clash with the Pharisees who are kind of the teachers of the law. They kind of should know the law better than anyone else. But what it is, is a clash of hearts. A clash of hearts. It's a clash of ideals. It's a clash of how one sees oneself, how one seeks to justify themselves before God. And in fact, if you're if you're the note-taking kind, our first point and kind of verses one to fourteen is really mercy versus legalism. Mercy versus legalism, and that's kind of what what's represented here. Jesus, mercy, Pharisees, legalism. Let's look at it together. Uh, we're told in verse one uh, that the disciples and Jesus they're going through the grain fields on the Sabbath. They're hungry. They begin to pick some heads of the grain and eat them. And the Pharisees, well, they're not happy with this. On first glance, we don't really know why, but we're told a little bit later, they said, Lord, look, your disciples are doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, of course, is very important to Jews. Uh, it's, also, it's very important when God rescues his people at the hands of the Egyptians. He rescues them by his grace and indeed his mercy. He lays out the Ten Commandments and one of the clear ones is in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you'll labor, do all your work, but then you're not meant to basically do any kind of work. Or at least that's what we're told. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So at the very least, at first glance, yeah, sounds like the disciples might be breaking the law, but let's look at a little bit closer. Because the idea, they're doing what's called reaping is kind of one of the ideas. Um, that's not unlawful, in fact, for the Sabbath. But the Pharisees have 
a legalistic mindset. I have a legalistic mindset, which means they're all about keeping the law, even if it's actually overextending or overreaching what the purpose of the law actually was. They're not stealing. In fact, if you want to look up uh, for your own reference, Deuteronomy 23, verses 24 to 25, it was perfectly lawful to take a grain and eat it as long as you didn't reap a harvest. But what's going on here? What's at stake? Well, actually, we're going to see in Jesus' response, it's revealing the heart of the Pharisees. It's really revealing the heart of the legalistic mindset. Because Jesus says in verse 3, haven't you read? Now, that's pretty insulting, first of all, because the Pharisees would have read. <laughs> they were meant to know. They were the guys. They were the guys who would know the law better than anyone else. So haven't you read? That's kind of a, that's a bit of a pot shot. But nonetheless, haven't you read what David did when he saw, uh, when what he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and his companions were ate the consecrated bread. That's just Another fancy word, like it's a the bread of presence is kind of the idea there. It's the bread that the priest would make and it would be in the holy place each week. No one else was allowed to eat it uh, except for the priests. But look what's at stake. Uh, David, if you, a bit of context, David is running from Saul. Saul is trying to kill him. David's been running for some time and he is starving to death. So at the time, the priests allowed it. So as long as the men were kind of ritually clean. But do you see what's going on here? Do you see a clash between Jesus' mercy and the legalistic mindset of the Pharisees? Because in the end, all the Pharisees care about is justifying themselves. They actually don't really care about history. <laughs> they don't care about uh, they don't care about that. What they care about is a justification of themselves. Do you ever have kind of a legalistic mindset? Do you have a mindset of like, I'm going to follow the law, I'm going to follow this to the letter of the law, but do you know what that does over time? Time over time, if you have that mindset, it kind of leads to one of two things. It either leads to pride, this self-inflated ego, that says, hey, look at how well I'm going. Yeah, I might not be perfect, but look at, well, look at how well I'm doing. And it also, at the same time, it thumbs, we thumb our nose at people who don't. Yeah, oh, I'm better than that person. I've kept these laws, they've kept, they haven't done this. But it can also lead to the complete opposite. Kind of self-abasing. It's like, oh no. Oh, I, I, not only haven't I kept the law, I can't do anything. Oh dear, I'm in big trouble. But you see how both don't belong in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus hasn't come to validate someone's pride or even to boost the ego of someone's self-loathing. No, Jesus has come to bring mercy. There's a difference. Jesus has come to bring mercy. And that actually becomes uh, really clear uh, as we go through in this next section, uh, because we come to the synagogue, basically uh, next to the temple, basically uh, one of the Jews' most prized places to go. And we're told that they come into contact with uh, a shrivel, a man with a shriveled hand. Now, that's, that's not great. <laughs> For a Jewish person to come in contact with a, someone with a shriveled hand, that means they, at the very least, are probably ceremonially unclean, that means they're worried about themselves. But even more, they're like, oh, maybe this person is not blessed by God. Maybe they're under a curse. That's kind of the idea. And we're not told, but at the very least, the Pharisees are using this as an opportunity to try and trap Jesus. Now, whether whether they brought the man with the shriveled hand in, it doesn't tell us. But at the very least, they're taking the opportunity to try and trap Jesus, to try and trap him. And so they say, well, you know, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because that's a real test, isn't it? Yeah, picking food, whatever, grains, eh, whatever. But this, this is like health. This is big. But Jesus is not phased by this at all. You would have thought maybe the Pharisees would have learnt from their first experience, but no, 
Jesus says, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, would you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, the Pharisee's heart is further exposed because it's not about picking grain anymore because they are hungry. The Pharisees now are revealed that they don't really care about people at all. You see that? Jesus is even going far to say, you care more about your sheep than your people. That's a real indictment on them. Again, it's a real indictment on the legalistic mindset. This is what that leads to. But then Jesus in his mercy acts in his mercy. In verse 13, stretch out your hand. So he stretches it out, was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus again. Jeez, the legalistic mindset on display again. They haven't even learnt the goodness that Jesus has come to bring in his mercy. No, they go out to plot and kill him. But he doesn't just have his love and his mercy on display. We're actually told uh, for the next from 15 to 21 that actually this is all part of the plan because from Isaiah 42, Jesus is the merciful servant. He's the merciful servant. We see this in verse 15. Uh, Jesus withdraws, the large cloud follows him. He warned them not to tell anyone about them. And then verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And this is Isaiah 42. Uh, so you're very much uh, welcome to uh, to look that up in your own time. But Matthew is a big fan of Isaiah. Uh, we have seen lots of references to Isaiah in the book so far. And this is what's described. The character of the Messiah. He will be gentle, we're told. Not harsh or judgmental because he will have the spirit of God. He will be merciful and compassionate and abound in steadfast love. And verses 18 to 21 uh, describe the Messiah, not just giving Israel, but the Gentiles. That's all of us here, hope. That's a theme throughout Matthew as he brings up the Gentiles uh, all the way back in the genealogy. He describes wise men coming from the east, even the centurion a little bit later, we're going to see in Matthew, with greater faith than all of Israel. See, God's not looking for someone to attack every possible offense at the expense of mercy. He doesn't want someone to make up a list of rules and condemn everyone who fails to keep the rule. No, the Messiah has come to bring compassion and mercy towards the poor, towards the oppressed. And actually, this is a bit of a foretaste, not just for now, but actually the final judgment to come because... We're told that the oppressed will find mercy and justice in the Messiah, in Jesus. Those who oppose that, they will experience divine judgment. See, Jesus' kingdom is characterized by this kind of mercy because he himself is the merciful servant. As we reflect together, for a little while, what does it look like for us if Jesus is the merciful servant, if he is the Lord of mercy? Well, what does that mean for his followers? What does that mean for us today who seek to follow him? What does that mean? Very simply, love mercy over tradition. Love mercy over your rules. The rules that you have created for yourself or the rules that other people have imposed perhaps on you I once heard someone describe rules and traditions like this. Traditions are the living faith of those who have passed away. It gets more bitey, though. He says, traditionalism is the dead faith of those who are alive. That's pretty confronting, right? Because traditionalism and rules without worship is hollow. It's not worship. 
So whatever rules you may have created, it could have been through years. It could have been through your family experience. It could have been maybe through coming to church for some time. And we all have them. So the question is, do your traditions, do your rules, do they leave out mercy? Or does your mercy interrogate your rules and your traditions? Does the mercy of Christ force you to evaluate and maybe get rid of those traditions and rules that you have for yourself? That's what Jesus has come to do with the Pharisees, and it's what he's come to do for us who would seek to follow him, because the kingdom that he brings is one of mercy. But why is it so hard? (laughs) Why is it so hard for us to love the mercy over our rules? Because if we find that hard, it reveals our heart. If we find it hard because it reveals what we truly value. It reveals our mindset, our heart. Do we see Jesus as the one who goes forward to follow as as someone who is a strict rule follower? Well, of course he follows the rule perfectly. He's the son of God. But he has ultimately come to bring mercy and justice. See, if it's all about rule keeping, not only do we have no hope of salvation, but we are characterized as people who are all about crossing the I's and dotting the T and looking down at others who don't. We will be ungracious. We will be unmerciful to those who so desperately need it. But if we are characterized by the mercy of Christ, our life and our attitude will look radically different. We will be characterized by mercy. We won't thumb our nose at other people. Instead, we will seek to help. We will seek to reach out, not only with the gospel, but also in our lives. We will be ready and very quick to forgive. We will not hold grudges we will instead remember that because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, just like we read in Ephesians 2, he made us alive when we were, what, dead in sin. People who are dead in sin can't follow rules. But they have received mercy. So we get to be merciful because Jesus has shown us mercy. Because he is the Lord of mercy. So let's quash those traditions. Let's get rid of those rules. Because they won't help worship. They won't help us be merciful. Because Jesus has come as the Lord of mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Father, we thank you that Jesus has come in his kingdom to bring a kingdom that is one characterized by mercy. Father, we pray that we who find it so easy, and so many of us do, to feel like rule following makes us right before you, makes us right before other people. But Father, if that's our attitude, we pray, Father, that you would quash that by your spirit. Because, Father, we have only been redeemed because of your mercy, because you made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our sin. Father, I ask that this would go in our lives going forward for many of us here today who need it would be characterized by the mercy of Christ. Father, we thank thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.